dealing with the all the issues related to construction costs and trying to keep those under control with the site. So, so I think the site challenge was was a huge one on that. And you know, I think the lessons learned from that were really um, to start at the beginning to look at all the options and consider things in every different way. And it's never uh, wasting time to spend more time in the conceptual phase looking at options because it's going to cost you a lot more money and a lot more time later on to do that. Right. Today we have with us uh, Paulette Taggart, Paulette Taggart Architects in San Francisco. Um, She's taken the time to sit down with us today. Paulette, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Sure. Glad to be here. Awesome. Do you do you mind if we just jump right in? And can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Sure. Um, I grew up on the East Coast, just outside of Boston, um, in the suburbs. Um, and in high school, um, my family moved overseas to Den Haag, The Hague, in the Netherlands. Um, and that, um, you know, it was great as a as a teenager to move to a small city that was sort of, um, you know, architecturally interesting and kind of well-defined. And I think it definitely impacted um, me getting into architecture because, you know, as you at the foundation are probably aware, since you're doing so much of what you're doing is trying to get, you know, high school um, age um, folks interested in architecture, um, you know, for me, there there I, I, there wasn't any exposure really, except through um, you know what I saw in art museums and all that. But there were, certainly weren't any classes in design or or anything of that sort. So just the exposure um, visually uh, living in the Hague was was very positive. And then as I as I went to college, I I still hadn't thought about architecture at all. I um, I actually was interested in um, art and sculpture and math, and that kind of led me in, into architecture. But um, gotcha. that's the general background. So you weren't necessarily one of those people who was three years old playing with blocks and just knew from that moment that this is what you were destined to do. Yeah, I think that's more atypical for women because they aren't so encouraged to do that. That is true. On. Although I certainly had my share of what would have been called Legos at the time, but Legos hadn't been invented yet. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. And, and that was one of my favorite toys. So there were various things that kind of led me there, but not gotcha. so directly. It was kind of indirect. I started in a liberal arts college and finally ended up going to undergraduate school out at um out west, out of University of Oregon, which is what got me to the West Coast. Um, but always thinking I'd move back to the East Coast, I went back to graduate school at Harvard. Um, and then once I was there, decided it was kind of conservative architecturally and maybe a little sexist and I sexist and I was like back to the west coast so gotcha <laughs> here I am <laughs> I gotcha I um I was just talking to a gentleman that did his MBA at Harvard and he was from the west coast went out there to go do uh to go to graduate school and he said this wasn't architecture obviously it's business but he said it was just a very interesting um way of schooling right it's just there was very little feedback in the program it was like you had like half your grade was participation, half your grade was the final, and you didn't know if either of them were uh, were good or bad until they were given to you, right? So it was just like it was like it was very different for me. It was uh, kind yeah, of a tough one. Yeah, it's different because it's yeah. you know the main class is a studio environment, um, right? And they, I mean, one good thing about um, Harvard actually is it had great some great other academic courses in terms of history and real estate things that were very supportive of. Um, Sure. You know, filling out my education. So. Gotcha. Yeah, <laughs> that's interesting. This is a little off topic, but I was wondering, since you own your firm and you do some hiring, does it matter to you like at all where somebody went to school? Um, like, do you kind of have in your head, you're like, oh, well, if they did that program, I at least know the professor there. So I know they were taught this specific thing or, you know, it's gross generalization, but students that come out of this school think a specific way. Or is it just it is literally individual based and, you know, I need to know you that you, you know, went and studied, but it doesn't really matter. You know, there are a few schools um, like, for instance, VPI Virginia Polytech in, in Blacksburg, Virginia, that uh, still emphasizes a strong hand tradition of sketching and all that, in addition to all the computer work. And I really value that. So I always particularly notice students from there, although we don't see that many of them. So the school can make a difference. I mean, it's generally the individual, but 
the this the particular school, um, especially in a few cases, can make a real difference. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. That's always something I want to know. And for our students, right, as they're looking to go on to undergrad somewhere, right? Um, you know, we have our schools here on the West Coast in the Bay Area. Uh, UC Berkeley is always going to be on that list. Um, you know, Cal Poly down in Slow is always going to be on that list. Um, the couple programs in San Francisco. Um, but I think I think this is something that that students are thinking about a lot, a lot, a lot. And it does make me happy to hear you say that it is very individual based, right? It is not the end all be all uh, of the school that you went to that's going to dictate your your career and your, you know, ascending. Right. Yeah, that's certainly true. Yeah. What would you say would be one of the favorite parts about your job uh, as an architect? You know, we are, we do a lot of community facilities and affordable housing. And um, the reason I do that kind of work is because I feel like um, I can bring good design to a lot more people. Um, this this happened sort of back when um, I completed my first single family house. I was doing a lot of uh, early on, a lot of um, single family residential and uh, some commercial work because that's kind of what came when I started my office. Um, and after I finished this first house, which involved a lot of uh, weekend work because one of the partners lived in Arizona and they were kind of a commuting couple. Um, I was just like, it was exhausting. It was like, you know, two or three years of that. And um, not that I didn't work on Saturday anyway, but having meetings Saturday was different. Right, right. <laughs> Working Saturday. Saturday's a catch up day. <laughs> yeah, and kind of time to think design a little bit. And, right. you know, um, but I got done with that house and I was like, wow, I put in all this effort and I made a difference in two people's lives. I don't, you know, I don't think that's what I want to do. So at that point, that was in the early 90s, I started steering the firm towards doing work that really had an impact and on more people um, and uh, had an impact on people who didn't always get the benefit of good design. Right. Um, and, you know, and so and wanting to do uh, more new buildings, partly because that was really going to have more of an impact on the city, which lots of people experience. So, right. Right. Um, so you're so, able to affect more people that way. So now I would say, Zach, and answer your question though, that, that one of the things that I like most is just when we, you know, we finish a, a project, whether it's a community center or a housing, um, you know, some housing, we, we did affordable housing up at, um, in the Bayview at Hunter's View, um, it was, how can I say that? It was partly the planning, uh, the master planning. It was partly the buildings themselves that were done in a way that made um, the residents living there feel more comfortable, safer, uh, easier to get to know their neighbors and build community. So it was, um, the architecture itself had a really positive impact on people. And and that's probably one of my favorite things about, about the work that I do now. Right. That's a good one. That's a really good one. If we wanted to flip the script and say, what would be one of the hardest things about your job, or maybe even not on a day to day, but just one of the hardest parts of your journey uh, mm -hmm. in architecture, mm -hmm. um, what would you think about that? Well, <laughs> when I, you know, I, this is maybe a little less true today, being that being a woman is, you know, is is still a challenge. Um, it was more so, I think, when I was young, and especially because I look particularly young, that even when I had like seven or eight years of experience, I just looked very young and it was hard to uh, felt like I was being listened to and being heard. Um, so um, that was one of the big advantages of getting older where people have a, you know, a, a little more respect. <laughs> um, but that was hard when I was, um, you know, even like I said, I was a associate in um, a firm. Um, I worked with Dan Solomon for quite a while. That's where I started doing a lot of housing and, um, you know, anyway, I had a few experiences. I won't get into the details. Sure. That was a hard thing. Um, I think one other thing for me is just that I'm uh, I'm kind of on the edge between introvert and extrovert. I'm not a total extrovert. And I think there are times when you really have to be able to, um, I don't know about sell, but really convince people that you're um, the direction that you're thinking about for the project is really the right direction, whether it's your client or the community or the planning department, or, you know, there's a lot of that. And I think, uh, you know, over time, I kind of learned that it was, um, 
it was really about the project, not about me. And that made it easier to, to um, you know, how can I say this? Uh, understanding the importance of it to really communicate about it, that it wasn't personal. It was really gotcha. about the project. So Right, 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 right. There's, there's so, uh, some interesting things to unpack there. And I, on the topic of gender, I do believe that there have been strides made in terms of um, – women and minorities, right? Being able to, to get into design, uh, you know, become architects and engineers. One of the things that I noticed, in fact, my wife brought this to my attention. I, we were looking at an AIA survey and it was the number of women in particular had risen over the last 20 years of licensed architects, which was mm-hmm. great. It was trending in the right direction. Right. The number of female owners right. had stayed flat. Right, not very many. <laughs> it was, it was, there was no change. Right. And right. she looked at me and she was like, why, what, like, why, right? Like, what is, like, we're going, we're in the right direction in terms of getting licensed, but it's flat. Right. And there's, there's a lot to unpack there, but it's, it's just, that's, that's interesting. And I feel like that's something partly because of where we are in the Bay Area and we, we tend to be kind of a catalyst for change, right? And partly because there just seems to be kind of more opportunity here than maybe in, you know, some other spots. Um, I just wonder if you had thoughts on that either way. It's kind of a long conversation. It, you know, it's sort of interesting when I think about it, actually, there were a number of women in, you know, my generation or a little younger who started their own firms. And I kind of knew more then than I do now. Mostly the women yeah. that I know now are, if they've started a firm, it's with their partner. Right. <laughs> as opposed to, you know, so as a couple, but not as a, so sure. I don't know. That's a whole big one. Um, yeah. It's just curious. I, I, I had interviewed a gentleman a while ago and he worked with, um, he did a lot of restaurants and one of the nonprofits he worked with was a nonprofit that was specifically built around uh, getting women and minorities into restaurant ownership. Uh-huh. Right. And so they provided all this framework. They actually had access to money, which was one of the biggest barriers. And right. then they provided this framework of mentors uh, who had gone through it. Right. And it's like, well, Hey, let me, don't make my mistakes. Let me teach you how to not do this. Right. And, and the success rate went through the roof. And I always, I, I watched that. I interviewed him and I thought to myself, why we should have something like this in the design world, right? Mm -hmm. This just kind of makes sense because of this problem, because we're increasing the number of people, but we're not increasing the number of ownership. So I, uh, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I just going to say, I, you know, I think it does maybe partly relate to the whole, thing we're going through now in terms of childcare and all that. I don't have kids myself. And it was, sure. a, it was almost a, I don't know if a specific choice, but I did feel like it was hard to have my firm and have kids at the same time. Sure. So that, yep. um, and I just think the way that our country does not support ch- children and childcare is a big issue for a lot of professions, right. especially ours, which can be a real grind. <laughs> right. Right. And there's, there are, wait, we just, I, I think I told you off camera, we just had a baby with my wife and I had our first in April and she's not back to work yet. And luckily that's, I mean, we can make that work financially. Yeah. Um, but that's not the norm. And and there are some very big question marks around like, what are we going to do when she goes back? Right. How much is that going to cost? Oh my God. Right. right. It's, it's like, you know, somebody's entire paycheck pretty much, which is, so it is a whole deeper conversation. I was just, I'm just curious because that, you know, obviously you have, you have done it, right. You have, you have built something and, and there just aren't a whole lot of, uh, women owned firms, completely yeah. women owned firms, right. Yeah. So, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, kind of to that tune, can you tell us a little bit about the process behind opening up your own practice and, and what kind of led to that? So it, it was a little bit of serendipity, I'll have to admit. Um, I think I I always thought I would eventually have my own practice, but um, it I, I I got back here from graduate school. I went to I went back to graduate school after working for about eight years. So it was you know a while later. I was um, teaching and all that then as well. Um, but I was working in a firm in the East Bay and. Um, they had a lot of uh, work in the Middle East and they, um, oh, well, so, so they had started, we were all on like 80% time for like six months or something. And so I actually had um, signed a contract for a project with um, a client 
um, I known through some previous uh, clients at one of the firms I'd worked for actually. Um, and I signed the contract with them on Friday for a pretty significant renovation. And on Tuesday we got laid off. So it was kind of like, well, wow. <laughs> there already, we go. <laughs> I, mean, I had been on part-time for quite a while. So I already had a space where I was doing a little bit of work and stuff. So, yeah. And then it just kind of took off from there. You know, it was, gotcha. um, I had, I had, I'd been in the Bay Area for a while, so I had enough, a lot of connections through my previous work. And, um, you know, I just started getting a lot of smaller work to begin with residential and commercial really from those same clients that just kind of mostly just kind of came through word of mouth. So Gotcha. And then it just snowballed from there? Well, you know, it was, I, there were times that were tougher than others. You know, um, there was, uh, we had a, one of our first big projects went out to bid um, the day before the 89 earthquake. And of course, after the quake stucco and steel was like cement plaster and steel was like, whoosh, through yeah, the roof. right. So that just like killed it. Um, right. and, and, you know, and, and a few years later, um, I was, that, that was when I really decided to make the shift to a different kind of work that, that took a lot of effort because, the work that I do now, the community work is a lot, a lot of it is public work. And so it takes a different process to get the work and the affordable housing uh, is, you know, there's a, there were a certain set of architects that were just kind of doing it over and over. So I kind of had to work my way into that slowly. So it, I, I have to say it took quite a while to, to really, um, and doing a lot of kind of smaller, grittier projects to get to the point where I was really doing the work that I wanted to do. Gotcha. I can't really say it was all that easy in the beginning, sure. but getting where I wanted to be to the work I wanted to be doing wasn't. <laughs> gotcha. On that topic of projects, is there a, a specific project that stands out in your mind? Um, either something you're proud of, and you've talked a little bit about the uh, community-based projects, but um, something that you, where you just learned an incredibly valuable lesson. You know, there were a number of them actually in different kinds of ways, I guess. There was, there was one project we did um, it's called La Casina. Um, and it's actually, it, this was, um, I had a residential client who, uh, she, she was a teacher, actually not a developer, but her family um, were developers back East. And so she kind of came from that background and she really wanted to do something to support women. And so she had this notion, which she had, had, had been done before, but not much of, um, of a nonprofit that would help um, low-income women, particularly in the mission, um, develop cooking businesses and catering businesses and get them out of their house, get into a commercial kitchen, give them business training and all that. And so um, we found a site with her and kind of found a nonprofit and, you know, uh, develop kind of develop some plans for the right size project and a use for the rest of the site. And, um, anyway, and then the whole process of getting the project approved, it was interesting because um, there was a lot of opposition to it. People felt like it would, some people who had especially recently bought in the mission um, were feeling, especially some Hispanic people were feeling like, you know, we got in here, it's like, we don't want to see it turned into a lower income community, you know, so there was sort of that kind of nimbyism. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> to say. And uh it took a lot of uh, patience of meeting with people again and again and in groups and as individuals and all that. And, um, you know, we finally won over almost everybody and got the approvals and it all moved forward. And it's been kind of an amazing success story. They um, spawned like 30 restaurants, I think. And, you know, That's it's awesome. just a, a yeah. huge thing. So, it's yeah. Just, yeah. So that was, that was sort of working with the community challenge. There are other sites like the, one project that really um, we were very proud of that really started us in the right direction of what we wanted to do was the first two blocks of housing that we did out at Hunter's View and the Bay View, which was part of the Hope SF program and was, uh, you know, taking this old public housing site and reimagining it to um, have three times the density and be more of a mixed use, you know, public housing is all the, uh, it's not only affordable, but it's the, the lowest level of affordable where it's like, I think the maximum income is like 20% of area median income or something. Whereas wow. 
most of the affordable housing we do goes up to 80%. And right. some we call more workforce actually goes to 120%, which is still almost impossible to find around here if it's not you know, supported in some way. Right. So that that project was really interesting and challenging in a lot of ways, but in one way in particular, um, it was an incredibly hilly site. And so being able, designing, thinking about what was the appropriate way to think about the project for the particular blocks we were working on, which were really steep, like over, you know, 50 feet of grade chain over this small block. Actually. Wow. Um, and then dealing with the all the issues related to construction costs and trying to keep those under control with the site. So, so I think the site challenge was was a huge one on that. And you know, I think the lessons learned from that were really um, start at the beginning to look at all the options and consider things in every different way. And it's never uh, wasting time to spend more time in the conceptual phase looking at options because it's going to cost you a lot more money and a lot more time later on to do right. that. Right. <laughs> Awesome. That's oh challenging. I, I remember going out to Hunter's Point a few times uh, before there was a fair amount of things built out there. And that was definitely an area that that needed some benefit. Um, it needed, yeah. And Hunter's it, Point itself is kind of flatter, but Hunter's right. View is Hunter's actually view, right. particular. Well, it, just the difference is it's really uh, a pretty steep. The whole thing is pretty steep hillside. Right. right. Yeah. That's crazy. But it's the same area. <laughs> right. Around leadership. Uh, who are some of the leaders leaders in architecture uh, that you admire or that have inspired you in some way? And that can be as a business owner and, and developer or as just purely a designer. It's, it's sort of interesting because back when I was in school, I think um, I was really inspired by Louis Kahn. Do you know who he is? I don't. Yeah. So he he was a kind of classical modern architect, I'd have to say, um, that design buildings really thinking about you know he he used to say like ask the brick what it wants to be you know he, <laughs> and it, his projects were a lot about structure and light um okay. and the the light part has of course really stuck with me the working in san francisco i think my buildings are less about being true to what the structural structure is because they're often wood frame and there's not that much integrity to the structure but anyway con did he did a building called the Salk Institute down in La Jolla, which was kind of amazing, just, you know, in terms of how it took advantage of its site and oriented itself to the ocean and this stream of water running down the middle of this courtyard out to the ocean. It's just inspiring and kind right. of spiritual, you know, yeah. uh, which uh, even though the work I'm doing is, 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 is not quite that. Um, I think we always try to get an aspect of that, sure. that into it. And um that's why I think another another building, another architect that inspired me a little in that way is, is one, a more recent architect named Peter Zumthor, who did some baths in um, Switzerland, which were really kind of spiritual, the spaces themselves. But on a really different note, um, Jane Jacobs was a um, more from a, she wrote a book called The Death and Life, I think The Death and Life of Great American Cities. And it was really about how, you know, at that at that point, um, this was back like years ago when everybody, all the planners were building freeways through the cities and all that. And she was speaking then more like we speak now about how much those were destroying cities and we needed to value the old neighborhoods and build off their quirkiness to make cities that really work for people. Um, right. You know, anyway. Right. That's a, it's a really interesting topic. I, I talked about this with Clark Manis a few months back uh, about Oakland, the Oakland A's potentially uh -huh. moving. Well, now they're talking about moving from Oakland, right? But at that time, the waterfront site in Jack London Square was the ideal site for the ballpark. That's what they wanted. And we had this conversation kind of around baseball parks in the same uh -huh. way, which is they went from being in the city, like I think of Fenway in Boston. Right. right. And, and in the middle of the city, right. Just in it. And then it, it, there was a long push away years after that to more like the Oakland Coliseum is now, which is kind of away from things, huge right. parking lots, you know, all that. And then the giants kind of brought back in 2000, uh, what was Pac Bell park then mm -hmm. back into the city walkable, you know, in the mix. And that's, it's kind of interesting to watch the ebbs and flows. Right. And, and things come yeah. around again. So, yeah. yeah. Um, I like it. Um, 
All right, last question for you. This is the one that we always ask. This is geared to our students. Um, what is the best advice that you could give to an up and coming design professional? Someone who is studying or, or is maybe even just considering a career in architecture or one of the, one of the design fields? Well, I think if, if, uh, if one decides one really does want to go into architecture, that one should, I don't know, when you're starting, I think you should really learn um, to learn to, you know, to, how can I say this, to broaden your skills, to, to acquire all the skills of an architect. Um, I mean, uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, um, um, almost all of us, you know, use some of them more than others as we, um, as we figure out what's really important to us and what our passion is. But I think if, if one can give oneself a base in a much broader, um, you know, across the, the realm of understanding buildings and design and the city and people and how things affect people, um, that then one can kind of um, grow into what their passion is and, um, and have the, the tools to, to be able to move that forward. Um, gotcha. Gotcha. So would you say then, it doesn't necessarily have to be by size, but I kind of think about this like as a smaller firm where a student can come in or, you know, newly licensed uh, a design professional could come in and be just that kind of exposed to more and, and just have different opportunities. Whereas I think of like, maybe this is wrong, correct me. I think of the big shops as you come in and you have this one specific thing that you're working on. And that's kind of, you know, you're, you're highly specialized from the beginning. You're talking about now in terms of experience. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think, um, I think people need to kind of manage their own like growth that way. So I think you're right. People that go to a small firm get a much broader range of experience. Um, but I also think there's some things you can get at a larger firm um, in terms of sort of organizational skills, things you can kind of learn from the firm about how they work that are also valuable later. So I think it's a question of um, in terms of one's early experience, um, managing what you need to acquire in terms of skills, especially as you start to understand what's important to you, what you're best at, what you want to be doing, um, you know, what skills you're going to need. I think at first, that's why at first though, I'm just thinking you need the broader skills and you're probably yeah. you know, starting right. out. It's uh, you'd probably do get more from a smaller firm. Although frankly, sometimes a smaller firm can make, you know, can teach you more if you come in with a little bit of a few skills you've learned. True know, somewhere else. So right. it's a balancing act, but it's more right. managing your own early years so that you gain and put together all the skills that you need, I think. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I love that. And I, that, that acquisition of skills, right. Understanding that skills are tangible things and that this is, that's more valuable in the beginning than money. Not that, not that we're doing, you know, free work or things like that. I mean, there's time and a place for that, but we're not talking about like unpaid internships or things, but the acquisition of skills, right? Building that pyramid base wide so that it can come up tall. And support you well, right? Right. It supports you well because I, I I hear this a lot. You know, this architecture is it's an endeavor, right? It's a it's a journey. It's a mission. It's not, you know, we live in tech and sometimes people start a tech firm with the sole purpose of building it up to sell it three or five years later, right? It's a, it's a quick hitting, it's a, you know, boom, you're done. And then you retire or you go on to the next one, whatever. Right. I think of architecture, the exact opposite of that, right. <laughs> it's, just, it's a long, long game. And the whole idea is to keep building skills so that you can keep playing. Right. Yeah. So absolutely. I love it. Awesome. Paula, this was absolutely wonderful. Thank you for sitting down with us today. Um, Genuinely, genuinely appreciate your time. Well, thank you, Zach, for organizing this. Absolutely. We, uh, and uh, actually a quick plug, uh, because we are promoting this as of Sunday, uh -huh. um, we have our virtual uh, foundation fundraiser, which is going to be a fitness challenge. Um, the, the theme is Bridge the Gap. Uh, so it's going to be fitness related. They're doing it with the bridges in San Francisco, which would be kind of cool and around the Bay Area. Um, and we'll send out a bunch more details to folks. Uh, but if you want to hear more about that, please, uh, please send us an email. Um, Paulette, thank you so much. Really, really appreciate it. Okay. Thank you, Thanks Zach. Again. Pleasure. 